You know, today we will spend, you know, three hours with one hour of this lecture. Our guest lecture is now start at uh, 4.15. It will take us until 5.15. It's time to take it within the hour. And uh, the next uh, two sessions, we will not have an activity today. We won't have a seminar. I will do a double lecture. Uh, one will be on uh, teaming and the other one will be on emotional intelligence. So uh, this is how we will proceed today. So about uh, Mr. Alapis, the CV is uh, up on uh, Clear Glass. You can see the studies and what he has been uh, active on. He <coughs> analyzed very much the Brexit concept, the Brexit idea, or the Brexit movement, because it's uh, interesting to to see you know how it all started and uh, where we are today. But it's also more interesting to see the leadership of the key protagonists because the moving the country from, from the European Union is a big decision. So there is you know you need to have strong leadership skills to convince someone you know the country either to stay or to convince them to leave. But convincing is one part. The next part is, how do you handle your decision? Okay, now we're out. So you still need the leadership to maintain the trust and to maintain the, 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 the balance and the, and the peace in the country that now that we are out of the European Union, we can still carry on, okay, at the end of the day, of the world. The same thing happens, you know, with the other party. If, let's say, we were staying within the European Union, the leaders should have, you know, convinced the people that that was the right decision and Look now, you know, why it is the right decision. So leadership is not only on deciding, but also on sustaining, but defending your decision. Today we are five years after the Brexit, you know, five years and a few months, after 2016 with the decision, and it would be good to see, I don't know if Mr. Arapi will give us one um, estimation of, you know, more or less what is the situation today, uh, after closing the first period, which is the first year, I believe it would be like, more research and to be done on what are the consequences of this, of this decision. Of course, we haven't seen Brexit yet in its reality because that just this year we have the difference between international and, uh, and home students that the trees have said. So for four years, we did not have that, haven't seen that impact. So we will see all that from a leadership perspective and uh, Mr. Alapis will analyze, you know, the conservative side you know, what was the leadership traits, characteristics, you know, how this decision was taken, and also the, uh, the let's say, you know, the political uh, side of the um, uh, Remain campaign. No, the, the Conservatives and the, and the Labour Party. And the, and the Labour Party. In, uh, in America, we call them the, the Liberal Party, so here we call them the Labour Party. Okay, so I think it's very interesting, and I know because I follow Mr. Arakis, you know, all, on all his research that he's been doing on uh, the Brexit, because it's something that, that impacts all of us. Why it impacts all of us? Because we live in a country that this country now has to face this decision. Economy, economic decisions, trade, uh, strategic partnerships, uh, strategic alliances, they have to be now to see under a different perspective. Okay, we have Germany, for example, as one of our strategic alliances, maybe now the Germans are a little bit upset because of the Brexit. You know, we'll see, uh, is this something that impacts you know, the relationship between the countries or not? Or for how long? So it impacts everything. So some leadership decisions that have long term impact on almost everything we do business, life, careers, finances, plan, family, okay? everything. So, Mr. Larapis, I'm very happy on behalf of the class, I would like to say, of me. The School of Management at Sunway University are very happy to have you and thank you for accepting the invitation to give us your uh, wisdom on this topic and uh, we are very much interested to hear to see this leadership comparison of the, the two uh, parties that were protagonists of this uh, very important event. Thank you very much Professor uh, Markopoulos. Good evening uh, and, uh, everyone, uh, my name is uh, Michael Arapis and it is an honour and a privilege to be uh, with you here today. Uh, you will excuse us because uh, we will have, we'll have some technical difficulties. The gentleman came earlier, so the microphone is not working. Uh, so I will have to stand here. I hope that you can see the slide. I don't know, uh, Professor Markopoulos, if perhaps you can see, they can see from the back because the, the, the template is on blue. I don't know if you want us to make some adjustments with the lights in the back. Please let me know from the outset. Okay, but if you can see from the back of this camera, this is okay. So you are fine, all of you. Okay. 
So I will try and I said, okay, to speak as, as loud as, as I can. Yeah. Okay. I think it's better. But that's, yeah. be, that's better, I will, right? Okay. So uh, I have been uh, involved um, uh, with uh, this uh, campaign uh, for a few uh, years, and uh, this is actually a very exciting topic that is very close to my heart. I, I studied it extensively as part of my law degree uh, in the aspect, of course, of EU law. And then when I was doing my first uh, master's, my dissertation was on how uh, a country can actually leave and withdraw from the European Union. And I submitted that uh, prior to the 2016 uh, referendum. So I have prepared a series of slides for you. Do not be alarmed, do not be intimidated. I have many slides. The purpose is for you uh, to see a lot of images, uh, to have a, vis a proper visuali visualization of, uh, the, uh, of this uh, campaign. And under every slide, you can find the source and you can have uh, the, the opportunity at your own time, of course, to read a number of uh, very uh, interesting uh, articles. The lecture will be divided, in effect, in uh, three uh, uh, parts. We will start uh, with uh, the history of the relationship of the country with uh, the European uh, Union and uh, everything that happened uh, uh, that led to the advisory referendum of 2016. Then the middle part will be, uh, we have chosen four key protagonists that played part and we'll examine the mistakes and the tactics of the two campaigns. And then we're, uh, we'll uh, examine what uh, is the way forward, what the future holds for the United Kingdom, what is the vision of the government, and what we mean by global Britain. So I think that um, it's very important to have some very key uh, information about this very important country to give uh, a little bit of a context so the UK uh, is an important country with the 67 uh, million uh, people. It's a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. And uh, despite the uh, Brexit and everything, it's still extremely a mighty uh, military force, the most important military force in Europe. Uh, nuclear power, it's a member of the Commonwealth, it's a former empire, and it is the second largest economy in Europe, um, still of course, and the fifth largest economy in the world, with a massive GDP of 3.1 uh, trillion uh, US dollars. Uh, in the EU context, the Germ uh, Germany uh, is the most important economy, and France is second. But of course, the UK even now is ahead of France, so this hasn't changed throughout the, these years. Uh, a brief overview of the five decades of the UK uh, and its tumultuous relationship with the, Europe, the European uh, economic community as it was uh, when it joined in 1973. Uh, then the European Economic Community was renamed as the European Union as it is still now in 1992. Back then, the EU, before Brexit, had 28 member states, now has 27, and the UK had a very important presence. Almost 10% of the members of the European Parliament, the MEPs, were from the UK, so out of the 751. So the UK withdrew from the European Union on the 31st of January 2020. This was followed from 11 months of a transitional period which ended on the 31st of December 2020. And ever since, the UK is now a third country, so it's outside completely of the EU. Uh, in effect, this is more like a story of civil war, I will say. This is more like the story of the Conservative Party of the UK. The Conservative Party was the party who actually made sure that the UK will join the European Union under the leadership of Sir Edward Heath, of the Prime Minister of the time. Uh, and I have, that's why I'm saying I have a lot of photographs so you'll have uh, an interesting context. Um, so, in effect, this is the story of the civil war and the split between this party of the pro-Europeans and the Eurosceptics, because this thing existed from the, from, the, from the very first moment, this division within this party. And I say that this is the most successful party because I was reading that 
worldwide, there hasn't been another party that has been dominating domestic politics for so many decades. It dominated the previous centuries and uh, in, the, in this country, especially the 20th century, and in effect has been running the country again from 2010, and uh, perhaps it will last again for several years. Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister from the Labour Party, called the referendum. He came in government uh, after uh, uh, Ted Heath, and uh, he called, this was the first, some people do not know, uh, a lot of UK citizens do not know that this, uh, but the, the country had another referendum in 1975, where again all the main political parties, you see yes here, uh, you see a keep in Britain in Europe, and you see Margaret Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher, the very important uh, uh, worldwide figure, of course, the first female prime minister of the UK, all campaigned for yes. You see, these are iconic uh, images. And this is the, the actual result, and I think it's important for you to see. So yes, one in 1975 by 67 uh, to 32, so by two to one, people wanted to remain. And please note, you will see the difference, you will see why later, Yes goes first, and no goes second. So, several years down the line, the Prime Minister of the time, uh, David Cameron, uh, was a Prime Minister from 2010 until 2016. He was an MP from 2001 until 2016. He called this advisory referendum for the 23rd of June 2016. When did he do that? That's very key. Only a few months before, only on the 20th of February, 2016. So it was a very, very short campaign. It's very important for you to know that the distinction in, in, in life between what is actually the law and what is the reality, because the government didn't have to implement the result. This is the act that led the government to be able to have the referendum. They, uh, they were able to have the referendum before the end of 2017. So the fact that they chose the timing of the OVC was a massive error when they did it. Nevertheless, there was no requirement for them to implement the results. Technically, legally, it was only uh, designed to gauge the electorate's opinion on, you, on EU membership. This is exactly what happened in 1975. Again, it was a uh, non-binding and advisory referendum. But of course, as you will see, politically, when the government makes a decision, they cannot go back, so they have to implement it. When the Prime Minister called this referendum, two campaigns were created. The Remain campaign, and you will see here almost all the parties of the country. The Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Scottish National Party, so that's only in Scotland, the Green Party, and Plaid Cymru, that is the National Party of Wales. Uh, and it was, the campaign was led from the Prime Minister David Cameron, and of course we had the Leave campaign, or Brexit campaign. So uh, here you see the, uh, the Prime Minister campaigning with the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, and as you will see, it was uh, the London, of course, voted for to remain. Another key, uh, we have made a decision, obviously there were many people, but we have chose two people from uh, remain and two from Leave. The second person that I have chosen for remain was the leader of the opposition at the time, the leader of the Labour Party, the second biggest party, Jeremy Corbyn. As you can see from his expression, he was never really supportive. He never really believed in the European Union. He was always ambivalent. His lukewarm support and indecision cost it to him, to his party, and inevitably to the result. Because people expected Labour voters to vote for a Remain, and the, the leadership didn't really help with that. Nicola Sturgeon, uh, the, the first minister of Scotland, uh, from since 2014, she emerged as a national leader as well uh, after the referendum because the other parties accepted the defeat, but she didn't. And she kept campaigning and uh, uh, she is very popular. Of course, Scotland voted for Remain. So the Leave campaign, we will see now uh, some key figures. Uh, that's very important. The only party technically that supported this campaign, and that is why it was so successful, was that it was only one party. Some perhaps don't, don't even know what it is. That's the United Kingdom Independence Party. It's technically obscure now, because after they won, it became irrelevant. And, and some uh, prominent members of the other parties, mainly the Conservative Party. That was very important, as you would say. Why? 
so for me, that's the defining moment. When we say civil war, why? Because these are the two people, Boris Johnson, the current prime minister. And, that, and the reason that I showed you the day that the referendum was called is that this is an article from the day after. And what happened on the next day? The prime minister found out that perhaps the only person that he was afraid that he would succeed him as prime minister, he decided to join the other campaign. So it was a major, uh, as we can read it, and again, as with all this, I have taken screenshots, and here you can read the whole articles later. I think this is vital. This is the moment. If Boris Johnson obviously had joined the, uh, the prime minister, obviously the Remain would have won easily. But by joining this, he emerged as a national leader, and he changed everything. So, uh, these are the two main figures, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. And again, uh, afterwards I have uh, some uh, biographical information about them. We will start by this. This is the question and the result. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave? And leave, ironically, went first. That's another mistake, as you will see. And remain went second. And by this um, tiny majority, leave won. Uh, and we will see now uh, and add some, some photographs for you to visualize. I will flick through. So you see a divided country. And again, England voted for leave. Wales voted for leave. But London, of course, voted remain. Scotland voted remain. Northern Ireland voted remain. So a divided country. Uh, again, you see in uh, blue and uh, yellow. And uh, now, what happened? So the Prime Minister resigned after he accepted the defeat, that he had not, there was nothing else he could do. Uh, he gambled his political career and lost in effect. So he, he resigned as Prime Minister and obviously as a member of Parliament uh, after the referendum. As I said, it was not legally binding, but politically he had to implement it. There was no other way. So he was succeeded by the then Home Secretary and remain a campaigner, Theresa May. Uh, Theresa May was a very important member of his cabinet, uh, and uh, obviously you can see here she some uh, famous uh, photographs where she uh, supported Remain. She was not a, a keen supporter of Remain, but the fact that she supported technically Remain cost her cost her dearly because she was never seen afterwards as a supporter of Brexit. So for three years she remained the prime minister. And in effect, I love this photograph because in six photographs, it sums up, this was from day one until the last day uh, when she was almost crying when she left. Uh, so for three years, she was the prime minister, the second female prime minister of the country, that's a key. But although she started the negotiations with the EU, in effect, after three years, nothing was finished. So uh, it was a, a premiership that was dominated from Brexit, but didn't succeed. And what happened? So the major winner of all of this, as we will see, Boris Johnson, he was elected from the members of the Conservative Party as leader of the party and automatically prime minister. Uh, in July 2019, he's still the prime minister, and he started a series of negotiations for the withdrawal agreement here with the then president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. And also here with, everything all right? All right. Uh, so uh, the then uh, Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland, or Taoiseach, Leo Va uh, Varadkar in 2019. Um, because as you will see, and that is, this was one of the most complicated issues, and that is why you will see later that the Brexit not, hasn't really finished, and it's very difficult to say when it will finish. It's the border with Northern Ireland. This was one of the stumbling blocks, and the negotiations with Ireland, in effect, are still uh, a problem. So, let's see about some of the implications. A key aspect is the people. So, in the UK, uh, we have a lot of citizens from the e, uh, European Economic Area, so in effect the European Union, and we have, of course, many UK citizens who live abroad. As you will see from some statistics, this is the largest minority group in the UK. And this is very important. So, uh, only with the registration system that came into force after uh, the referendum, so over 6.3 million people, that's a massive, massive number, this is an unprecedented number, uh, have uh, completed this scheme in order to settle in the UK. Uh, if we include, of course, all the other people that before that, uh, they were already holders of dual citizenship, so let's say uh, French and uh, UK uh, citizens, 
we're talking about a massive, a massive number. This is very important, and uh, you will see why. And of course, how many citizens abroad? Over 1.2 uh, uh, million uh, UK citizens live in other EU countries, and over 5 million of them live abroad. So let's go now to uh, the four key protagonists that we have uh, already uh, have already shown you. So David Cameron, educated at uh, Eton College and Oxford, uh, and One Nation Conservative. He was actually a good prime minister, and uh, he was uh, considered as a modernizer for his party. He was very young when he took office. You can imagine he's just now 55, and he left at 50. Uh, so uh, he was a prime minister. You can see here some of the details uh, at your own time as well. Uh, and in effect, he had, in effect, he fell victim of his own success. This is here. When, uh, when he became prime minister in 2010, he didn't win an overall majority. And we had in the UK, after many, many decades, what was called a hung parliament. So no party had an overall majority. So there was a coalition government from, with the, uh, uh, of the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats. Surprisingly, in 2015, five years down the line, uh, he, uh, his party did, it, uh, did even better. So uh, suddenly he had to govern by himself. This meant that he had to, to follow a manifesto, uh, uh, he had to follow a promise that was in the manifesto of the party. The manifesto is a document that describes what the party will do, like the promise of what they will do. And there, uh, it, uh, it was mentioned that a referendum on the UK's uh, continuing membership on the EU will take place. This was decided before uh, 2015 because of the, uh, perhaps half of his party, because they were a year skeptics for years, they wanted to exit the EU. So in order to appease them, he promised that somehow a referendum would take place. Of course, at the time, he didn't believe that he would have to do it because he imagined that he would still uh, govern with the Liberal Democrats that opposed so he wouldn't have to do anything about it. So suddenly he had to live, uh, to live up to this expectation. And he campaigned uh, on this, and he agreed, uh, and he said that he will go ahead and do it. Basically, he had no other option, uh, politically. So the other person, as we saw, was Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, he is now 72. Uh, he was the leader from 2015 until 2020. Uh, and he has uh, been an, an MP here in, uh, in London since 1983. It was a surprise when he became a leader of his party, and uh, that's why he wasn't really supportive of uh, the Remain campaign. So, the person who uh, is the most important of this campaign is Boris Johnson, 57 years of old now. Again, similar background with uh, uh, David Cameron. He went to Oxford and before that to Eton uh, College, and he was the uh, mayor of London from 2008 until 2016. Please note this. He was an MP again from 2001 until 2008. But after his term as uh, London mayor was about to end, he returned to frontline politics when at uh, the election of 2015. So and he knew, they knew, of course, that the referendum would come, and they knew that it was about time for him to emerge as national leader. So he returned one year before the referendum to the parliament. A very smart choice, of course. Uh, so the other person is Nigel Farage, a very influential uh, uh, right wing and uh, for some far right leader. Uh, he was ironically a member of the European Parliament from 1999 until 2020 when the, the UK left. So he was going for over 20 years there uh, to campaign against the European Union. Nevertheless, he was doing that and people were voting uh, him to do so. Uh, and then he uh, was the leader of the UK, uh, of, of UKIP, for several years, as you can see, and then the leader of the Brexit party. After, after the relief campaign won, in effect, the, the UKIP party didn't have a use because they had already won what they wanted. So they had to, to, uh, to, to transform, and in effect, they created the Brexit party. And again, that, uh, after this thing was transformed as well, as you will see in the future. Uh, so, before I start with the blunders uh, of the Remain campaign, but I, I leave personally because I was uh, involved and I was very disappointed, I will have to say uh, that this is very important for your studies in leadership. There has, this is perhaps by far the worst campaign of leadership. Right? Uh, the, best, sorry, the, the, the best example of how uh, a leadership uh, can, uh, can 
campaign. So this was the campaign that was supposed to be the systemic one. As you have seen, it was supported from all the major parties, from all the key players, but they managed to lose. So that's a massive uh, a disappointment. It was extremely poorly run and poorly coordinated. So uh, the parties had their mind on other issues because don't forget that this, at that time, uh, in May 2016, so a month before the referendum, when the campaign, when people were campaigning from the other parties, they didn't really uh, knock on the doorsteps in order to convince people to vote for a Remain campaign. They were trying to convince them to vote for the local elections or the regional government elections in, uh, in Wales or in Scotland or even here in London or other, so as a party. So they were focused on, let's say, I'm a member of the Conservative Party, let's vote, vote for me. Uh, or vote for me if I'm a member, member of Labour. So they were not coordinated. This weekend, the effort to spread uh, the message, there was no unity. Okay. On the other hand, of course, uh, uh, we will see what happened with, um, totally different what happened with the Brexit campaign. So let's start. Uh, I have here a number of, uh, I think it's like a catalog of disasters. What not to do really. First of all, again, uh, the, 30, the 23rd of June. It was an extremely poor choice. Okay? It was a very short campaign. And uh, usually in the UK, votes take place, take place at the beginning of May. So they chose a very poor date because most students were away, so they couldn't vote because they have perhaps they were registered uh, uh, in the university address. Even some people were uh, finally not from Glastonbury Festival, 100,000 young people. All of these people, you would have expected them to vote for Remain, so they were not able to do so. A lot of people, especially young, were on holiday, and this is the key. They chose to use as the electoral register the register for the UK national elections, which meant that all the people that I showed you earlier, right, the 6.3 million people, most of them, okay, they didn't, they were not allowed to vote. They couldn't vote. And the, and if you might, and some people say perhaps that is fair, okay. What is not perhaps fair is that the majority of the UK citizens, the citizens of this country, because they were living abroad, in effect they weren't allowed to vote be because of the, of the system. So again, you would have expected the vast majority of these people that they were practically uh, interested to go and vote for Remain, but they were uh, mainly excluded. They were unable to go and vote for, for a number of, uh, of reasons. So this was uh, again another uh, blunder. Uh, for me, uh, a very important uh, point is that, um, as I showed to you as well, this might seem trivial, but it makes a difference because we, when you're voting, some people vote usually for the first choice. So in every, every time when you have a referendum, you have a yes or no option with yes first, as we saw in 1971. The fact that they had leave first instead of yes or no, this, is, this was again a, a cause for concern and uh, uh, nobody understood exactly why they ever did it. So the, every Remain party, as I said, had their own campaign. This was, a, a, this was very divisive. You could not see people campaign uh, next to, to, to each other. Uh, again, complacency was another factor. A lot of people believed that Remain would win anyway, so they didn't even bother to vote. Bear in mind that the elections in this country take, take place always on a Thursday. So a lot of people vote after work on a Thursday night. And you will expect London to be a factor for this. Everyone sort of expects that London will turn out to vote for Remain. And everything that could have gone bad went extremely bad on that day. There was a torrential rain in, in London, and the, the turnout was not high. Ironically, in the areas that they didn't want people to vote, perhaps that they would have voted the Brexit, and the, it was a, a bright, sunny, glorious summer sunshine. So uh, again, uh, another strategic mistake was that this was not the first referendum for David Cameron. And funnily enough, despite the fact that there's not a, uh, it's very rare in the UK to have referendums, he had three in his tenure. One in 2011 for, uh, as you will see, uh, for, uh, uh, as I think I mentioned it earlier. Anyway, uh, it was uh, for the reform uh, of the voting system. The second was the Scottish referendum in 2014. And again, the major parties didn't even learn from their own success. That is a key failure of leadership. In 2014, they felt that they were losing. So Scotland was about to become independent. 
And what they did, the leaders of the three parties, the Conservative Party, Labour Party, and the Liberal Democrats, united and went all the way to Scotland, and they promised the Scottish people that they have, that if they vote for uh, to, to stay with the union, it would be beneficial for them. They didn't do that properly in 2016. So uh, they didn't even justify to the people the benefits. Why should you be a, a member of the EU? They never even mentioned why, why the EU was even created in the first place to maintain peace in Europe after millennia of wars. They didn't do that. They ignored the legitimate concerns of working class people who were very worried about their financial condition. They were worried about their jobs, their benefits, their health care, their immigration. They, they were dismissed uh, with a very pedantic tone from the Remain campaign. They were dismissed as being poorly educated, just racist, just ignore them. It was unbelievable. Uh, uh, you know, the people for us that we were involved, uh, when we were having a discussion, I said, how we can convince people if you, if you treat them this way? They were saying, oh, you know, they're just racist. But I said, yes, I mean, this is not, a, this is not an answer. How you can insult people? Of course, people were alienated, they were upset, they were angry, and of course, definitely voted for the other side. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, the mistake about uh, how to deal with uh, uh, Boris uh, Johnson. Again, timing is everything in life and especially in politics. What I said, I showed to you earlier, this was an important point. The Prime Minister had to do this, that's fine. But he had the opportunity from the act itself, that's why I showed you the act, to have a referendum at any given time before the end of 2017. So the fact that he chose to do it then was a massive error. Why? Because it was at the height of the migration crisis in Europe. It was a time of where people, uh, it was the populist movement that was at, uh, uh, at its peak. Don't forget that a few only months after that, the Donald Trump was elected uh, in November in the United States. So, and also they didn't use properly the social media. Uh, and this was perhaps the very first campaign that was so overwhelmed, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, so dominated from the use of social media. They didn't use any national symbols. They didn't bother to, to use any patriotic rhetoric. Uh, in effect, uh, they were using very academic uh, uh, discussions, very dry uh, speeches, more like in lecture theaters, rather than on the doorstep or on the street trying to convince voters to vote for what they wanted. Uh, and again, they were saying about something, about an impending economic disaster. Of course, people were, uh, were not convinced, they didn't believe that. They felt that this was just scaremongering and they ignored them. And of course, another thing that I, for me was very uh, surprising was they didn't bother to use celebrities. Uh, and this is uh, another uh, problem. So, uh, and when they did, it was too little too late. So, the other campaign. As you saw, only from one perhaps minor party, they managed to win. So if you want, let's say, secrets of leadership, look at the Leave campaign, an extremely efficient campaign. It evoked sentimentality. It inspired people. Yes, they were using false claims. Yes, they were populist. Yes, they were uh, causing, uh, they were saying things that didn't make any sense, but they were communicating them very effectively to the public. So it was very successful because they were only focusing on the actual question. They didn't bother about anything else. Sadly, they legitimized racist and xenophobic tone of the political dialogue. This was unheard of. I've been in the UK for many years, and it was unheard of prior to 2016. And this led to a number of attacks, even deaths, of uh, EU citizens. Uh, I distinctly remember Theresa May apologizing to the Polish Prime Minister because some people uh, murdered uh, a Polish person because he was simply an EU citizen. Uh, so, some of their tactics. The, this is a very important thing. Because it was not led from one party, there were people from all the parties, they ignored all their differences about being, let's say, Labour or Conservative or, uh, or anything else. They were saying that we are here only for one purpose. So a unified campaign, uh, they managed to always have people uh, in their stalls. For example, where I live in Cardiff, wherever you want to, to go to the city center, you will see young people dressed in red, uh, trying to convince people to, to vote for uh, the independence of the country. It was very difficult to find people 
motivated to campaign for the Remain campaign, despite the fact that this was supposed to be organized from all the parties together. There was a lack of motivation. They obviously, and they portrayed themselves as the vote against the establishment. Again, this is not, the, this is extremely uh, uh, erroneous. That's not the case at all. But this is how they convinced the people. So they inspired the people, they were using red, they were using the Union Jack, they were using flags, they were talking about national pride, independence, and they were extremely focused on the social media, and I will show some uh, tweets later. They became the full campaign against the system somehow, no matter what that means. And they had a, a nice catchy slogans, live means live, okay. independence day, or take back control. Doesn't mean, that these things don't mean anything, but People were fascinated by them. The Remain campaign didn't even manage to produce one successful slogan. So they appropriated all the national symbols, especially the, the flag. They were speaking as if you know we were at war. They were saying we won in the Second World War, in the First World War, we will win again. We were not at war. This was supposedly a campaign that would make the, uh, the, uh, the UK will even do better, not simply will survive. The survival was not the question immediately but they managed to turn it into the, their own narrative. So they portrayed themselves as the only patriots. Like, so being a Remainer or a pro-European was seen as being less patriotic or, uh, or even worse. Uh, this is sadly still the case in the public dialogue. So populist campaign, but with always with hope and positive message. Somehow we will prosper, we will do better, we will do well. They were using racist and xenophobic slogans, that's what, that is true and they mainly targeted on English nationalism. They knew they couldn't win in Scotland, they knew they wouldn't win in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Winning in Wales was, a, was a, a success and a surprise, but they were focusing on the, um, uh, the so-called Middle England. Again, that's a term that doesn't mean much, but uh, this is what they were saying. And I have some examples here. They take a second to see uh, this, um, this slide. <coughs> so this is, these are the slides of the Leave campaign, the Brexit campaign, organized from Nigel Farrell and YouTube mainly. These are in front of the big event here, in the heart, the heart of London. Uh, of course, she was accused, uh, like this was like a racist uh, uh, poster. And again, very proudly, he sits in front of it. And here you can see the why people were very upset. Because this is on top. It's like an example of a poster that was used from the Nazis for the, the Jews in the Second World War. So he used uh, the, the same template for this, and that is why he was reported to the police for inciting ra racial hatred. Of course, none of these things had nothing to do with the EU. He was trying to use tactics about uh, refugees or uh, uh, other concerns that have nothing to do with, with the, the European Union. Uh, but nevertheless, they managed to win this narrative. Uh, so they used propaganda, extremely populist tactics. You I, I assume that some of you must have, you might have seen this. This is the most iconic image of the campaign. We're talking about the red bus. And, uh, so, and, and the slogan, let's give our NHS, the, Nat the National Health Service, 350 million pounds uh, <coughs> Uh, every week because apparently we're sending them to the EU. Of course, that's that's a lie. Okay, and ironically, and that is the article here. Uh, and I've used uh, on purpose a lot of links from the Daily Telegraph because this was a Brexit supporting uh, newspaper, the flagship of the Conservative Party and of the Brexit campaign. So even they, they are not very happy nowadays. Uh, and back then, it was mentioned just one day after the referendum, um, Nigel Farage. He said that by saying this, this was a mistake. So in effect, they won the, the campaign because of this lie. And only the next day, when the people were saying, oh, let's say, we'll go to the, the NHS and we'll have millions, they said this was a mistake because this would have never happened anyway. And this is the red bus. And in fact, even, uh, this was before Boris Johnson became prime minister, he was even prosecuted from a group for this because it was a lie. We, see, we send the EU 350 million, let's fund our NHS instead. Again, very, very catchy, Th things that people uh, uh, always remember, things that uh, people uh, 
uh, will feel very passionate about because the NHS is a very important thing for the country. Uh, so, again, they were using scare monitoring about uncontrolled immigration, and uh, this was another, as I said, the major factor of the campaign. They even made an outrageous claim that Turkey would join the European Union, and in effect, all its citizens, 76 million, uh, would come to the UK. Obviously, the, the, sadly, the Remain campaign didn't even bother. Perhaps they were thinking that perhaps people, the people will dismiss these uh, arguments uh, as nonsense. But some people believe them, and the Remain campaign didn't even bother to rebut these claims. And this was a major problem. So this is in high resolution the, uh, the poster. Turkey joining the EU. That's the official uh, poster of the Leave campaign. Vote Leave.uk, vote Leave, take back control. Again, you see very catchy. Red, Turkey is joining the EU. But they don't, they, don't, they don't even have to say what will happen. It implies that many things will happen. And this is the slide from the Vote Leave campaign. As I said, extremely focused on social media. Uh, Dave Cameron wants Turkey to join the EU. That was not even accurate. How will the NH, our NHS cope? Let's take control, and so on and so forth. Uh, so again, obviously, some, some commentators, you can have the opportunity to read some articles. They were not very happy with the vilification uh, of, uh, the, of Turkey. And uh, for example, even that they were using this kind of, like, um, some people, even this kind of uh, poster. <coughs> so, emotional arguments that were memorable, I'll bet and true, sometimes people don't, they don't uh, bother. They avoided answering on why and how things would be better. They never explained what was the problem and how things would be better. They were saying things would be better, how they would be better. How they are not, how they are not good now, they never mentioned it. They never bothered. They didn't have any actual discussion. They just dismissed things. They were just saying, uh, using slogans. They made unreasonable claims about the economy. Uh, again, it was extremely difficult to rebut this type of, uh, of uh, claims in layman's terms. And they took advantage of something that this is not an issue only in the UK. In many countries, we have in the in the EU uh, an anti-European or a Eurosceptic movement. This is because the vast majority of people. Uh, and they're not, they're, it's not their, their problem, it's not their, their, their form. Uh, the, uh, the educational establishment doesn't help people to understand what the EU is, how it works, the rules, institutions, regulations. So uh, when people are throwing some slogans, people don't really know about much about the EU, and, uh, and uh, they, they believed it. Now, uh, this is the architect of the Dominic Cummings. You might have heard of him or not. He was the architect of the Brexit campaign, and he, uh, on a very interesting article, you can, you can read how the Brexit referendum was won. And he specifically cites as the two major factors for the win, these two slogans, these two campaigns, the 350 million for the NHS and immigration. So he said, if you haven't used, as if you will read this uh, massive, it's a very lengthy article, if you will read this, he analyzes why, even if one of these two were not used, they wouldn't have won uh, the campaign. Now, let's go to the third part. That is what happens now, where are we now, how, how is the situation, the current leadership, uh, and where are we now? Uh, first of all, the, the, the fear of the max, massive exodus of the EU citizens didn't materialize. The vast majority are here in the UK. Yes, some people left, uh, but the vast majority are still here, so uh, that didn't, uh, wasn't really affected. There is a problem, though, about the economy when you will have a, a lot of EEC, EEA citizens uh, right now that they wouldn't be able to come anymore. This is a problem uh, because they were doing some um, jobs in bars, restaurants, and other uh, areas, or even, let's say, as lorry drivers. This was the iconic image from last year, uh, where you had thousands of lorries stuck in Kent. They couldn't even go to France, so this was disrupting trade. So uh, a lot of new, why a lot of the EEA citizens that they were already here will stay for the newcomers. It will, it's extremely difficult to come unless if they are doing, let's say, uh, highly skilled uh, uh, jobs. And obviously, uh, this is uh, and a lot of companies. And I have some articles at the end as you can read have left uh, the UK for other member states in order to obtain some of them the European passport. That means that they can trade within the other member states. So, uh, and again, uh, within the, uh, while the UK was in the European Union, was able to cooperate 
uh, with, uh, with other member states uh, on a number of, um, uh, of issues. It remains to be seen uh, how uh, things will progress. And for my, uh, the second master's, but also for my current research, uh, research, I'm very concerned about national security, what will happen, and how the cooperation between the UK and the EU will protect the country from conventional terrorism, cyber terrorism, organized crime, cyber crime, trafficking, or the rise, as we have seen, especially after the referendum, of the far right or another uh, uh, in, in the country. So all of these issues remain to be seen in practice. So where are they now, briefly? Uh, obviously, David Cameron left and he is nowhere to be seen. Uh, he wrote a book and uh, he was involved uh, lately, uh, it's on the news, in the uh, Green City scandal because he was trying to lobby government ministers. So things haven't turned out uh, very well for him. Bear in mind that if he hadn't won the referendum or if he had dealt with the referendum, and that is a massive leadership error, David Cameron could have perhaps even now still be the Prime Minister. Definitely would, it would have stayed until the end of 2020. So everything was destroyed out of one uh, wrong uh, decision that was poor, uh, poorly handled. Um, he didn't say much afterwards, but um, in a rare interview he said that he was hugely depressed, that he knows that some people will never forgive him, and that he confessed that every single day I think about it. And the fact that we, that we lost, and the consequences, and the things that could have been done differently, and I worry desperately. And of course, he criticized a little bit the current prime minister. Okay, where is Jeremy Corbyn now? This is even far worse, because Jeremy Corbyn, yes, he's still an MP, but although he was the former leader, and technically at some point he could have even become the prime minister, of course he never became prime minister, uh, he resigned after the disastrous election of 2019 for him, uh, Sir Keir Starmer became the, the leader, and after an anti-Semitism report, he was even suspended. So he's still an MP, but uh, he is nowhere to be seen. And, and uh, sadly, or ironically enough, I was reading that he may even try to run as an independent in his constituency. So again, politically destroyed, totally out. Far Nigel Farage, again, nowhere to be seen right now. Uh, he's a leader of the Reform UK. Uh, so the Brexit, the UKIP in effect became Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party became kind of like the Reform Party. Again, that's pointless now because they, were, they fell victims of their own success, uh, and they, he's out of politics. And let's go now to the absolute winner, the absolute winner of the whole campaign, Boris Johnson, the current Prime Minister. Uh, he won, and uh, he proclaims himself as the person who will lead the UK, and he has this image and this uh, vision for global Britain. So, of course, as we, have see, as we can see here, it's extremely mighty force, and I have some information from you. Is this the future? Perhaps you might have seen it. Uh, it was only a few months ago. Global Britain, focus. So, Australia, UK, and US. Uh, an agreement between these three uh, countries. A, tri a trilateral security partnership, because uh, like the English-speaking world uniting, uh, and then what they want to do is even to build a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines, so to give and give nuclear uh, technology to uh, the, the, the um, to Australia. They are trying to portray themselves uh, as like uh, the country that will counteract, in effect, the. Uh, the Chinese domination of the Pacific, so that somehow the, the, the country left the EU, but somehow it's even far more important now because it has a global presence. That is the theory, of course. What about the relationship with the other EU countries? We see here the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Okay, the, we were told before the referendum that somehow the UK will be very close to the EU. But as you can see, the relationship has broken down, again, from the people who supported the uh, Brexit, not from someone else. They are, they are not really happy with the developments. Is it like a never-ending Brexit? As I told you, the issue of Northern Ireland, that's a problem. They are still campaigning now. And I have two photographs for you uh, the, of the same one uh, to see different resolution. So you see the UK Brexit minister, Lord Frost, uh, uh, here uh, discussing with the uh, vice president of the European Commission. So they are still, we are still, we are now five and a half years after the referendum, and um, over a year since the country left the EU officially, 
and they're still discussing about Northern Ireland and what will happen. Uh, and this is the issue. I, I, I saw it, like, this is today, this is today. The massive impact on, on trade, uh, the, directly from Ireland. The goods that were shipped directly from Ireland to the EU, and they are bypassing the UK, uh, they're up by 50% in the last six months. So, and, and uh, as Professor Markopoulos, of course, very eloquently explained, we haven't even seen the implications of Brexit because of COVID. You see, uh, we haven't uh, uh, seen what will happen in terms of uh, the jobs and when people will return back, or with trade when everything resume, uh, resumes and goes back to normal. But still, even today, you see, every single day, you see uh, things are problematic. And uh, the last few things are this. So, a campaigner, again, um, uh, again from the Telegraph, who supported Brexit because he believed, as he said, in the vision of global, global Britain. Fraser Nelson, you see, uh, here, he was saying that he really believed uh, in the vision that was set from Boris Johnson and Michael Gove that they will have a global Britain and that they will go out into the world, outside of the shackles, as they were saying, of the European Union. And now what he says, was I right to support Brexit? He is wondering. And if this is global Britain, I'm starting to wonder, because he's not very happy with some trade deals, even with Australia, because he thinks that some of these deals are not going far enough. And uh, so uh, the cost of uh, Brexit, that is, Something that I uh, again came yesterday, that is, um, um, so from the Center for European Reform, that, and is, in effect, this slide that allows wins the argument. We're not doing better, we're doing far worse. So the UK tra goods trade was 11.2% or 8.5 billion lower than it would have been if the UK had stayed in the EU single market and customs union. So, uh, Obviously, evidently, and this is perhaps something, something that you can, uh, again, you can see the slide, uh, you can use the link here, and you can download the PDF, and you can read uh, further financially why uh, uh, we're in this uh, predicament. And this is just, of course, the beginning. And uh, the people actually sense that, and this is the last slide. Only a few days ago, on the 26th of November, 11 months into the year, British people uh, believe that the Brexit is going badly, by 52%, going well, so 52% vote in 2016, but only 18% believe now that it's going well, and 20% don't really know, or they are ambivalent, but 52%, so now the majority of the people are not particularly happy with the situation. So here I have a number of interesting uh, articles for further reading uh, for you. Uh, and what I would like to say is a very, very big thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about a very, uh, an issue that I'm very passionate about. It's very important for you to, to remember that this decision and the way that was poorly handled, as I explained, and perhaps you will read more in the slides because we, we were running out of time, uh, has shaped the country for the last five and a half years and will be continuing to do so for the years to come because it hasn't really ended and we haven't actually seen its proper um, uh, implications yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Arabis. I haven't seen this presentation. I mean, I've seen a version of this two years ago, but I haven't seen the extended version that you have done for us. Well, I mean, I've seen it here, I can't wait you know, for the first question. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, uh, what are the questions that you want now? Yeah. I have three questions, yeah. Of course. Uh, so the first one is, why did the Prime Minister resign after losing the vote? I have the same question too. Because if, if he's, if he's in, a, in a leadership position and if his people want a certain thing, although it wasn't his opinion, he shouldn't have taken the lead with it and made their wishes come true. Uh, I just mean why and... Let me ask after one by one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to make more sense. Okay, um, that's a very interesting point. I think that what he also felt and what the opposition felt and what the Brexit campaign felt was that because he wasn't in it, if you like, he didn't really believe in what they call, were calling themselves the Brexit vision and he was op uh, opposing it, he couldn't have implemented something that he definitely disagreed and he didn't believe. So his supporters wouldn't have liked it. The other, uh, obviously, politically, uh, he was extremely weakened. 
uh, he was very unpopular because of the, even his own supporters were very angry with the fact that he jeopardized the future of the country. And uh, in effect, he gambled his political life. So it was, uh, he, his position was untenable. But it's not about him, it's about, about the country. By the way, I mean, if, 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 we're, if we're talking to him, at the end of the day, he should have just went back home. But basically, it, I mean, even his own government didn't support him anymore. In fact, uh, we, there was no time, and we just focused, because this was not somehow a lecture about the history of Brexit. I tried to show you the leadership points here, because it was a different yeah. point. So, for example, there were other key figures in the government who supported Remain, or other key figures who supported Brexit, that had their political careers destroyed as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, okay, everyone expected that Boris Johnson would become the Prime Minister in 2016, it was only by a fluke, or in a, she was very lucky that Theresa May became, because other people turned back against Johnson. So it was like an internal conflict. So the whole, and that is why I say it's a civil war, because the, the because of uh, the lack of leadership in the Labour Party ever since they voted for the, uh, for uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, that many people, especially his parliamentary party, never wanted him. Okay. Uh, the country has been dominated by one party, so the two divisions within the party. So the, the, the side that was led from Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others who won, they felt that people like uh, um, that David Cameron and George Osborne, the, the, the number two, if you like, of the government, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, so the Finance Minister of the country, uh, that he had to leave politics as well. So they lost and they were out and someone else uh, somehow took over. And the only reason that, um, that Theresa May uh, took over was because, because she, was not, she, was not, she was like a very moderate uh, remainer. That's why she was allowed. But so, it was his decision to leave, yeah? Yeah, it was his decision. And, uh, but uh, obviously it was with heavy heart, I'm sure. But I mean, politically, he couldn't do anything else. And even now, uh, after so many years, uh, he's extremely like uh, hated from uh, great uh, uh, parts of the population. That's the outcome. That's the outcome. Be because the people. That's the actual. Uh, yes, because he, he led he led the country to this turmoil. Yeah. Be because he could he could have done it differently. He could have, uh, uh, for example, I never understood why on earth they were so in a, such a hurry to have the campaign uh, only uh, in very few short months. In Scotland, the campaign lasted for two years. Ooh. So they had, uh, in the initially they were losing from the SNP, that the SNP was saying again, independence, independence. Mm -hmm. But then they had the time to explain to the people the positive aspects of remaining with the union, other than going, uh, let's say, on the long journey alone, as uh, the, the SNP was saying to the people. But here in the Brexit campaign, they never had the chance, because when you have only three, four months, and it was, uh, you know, uh, people were saying, let's go get our independence. They were saying that we will, uh, we will win like we won in the Second World War. So they were uh, turning it into a very nationalistic or a very patriotic kind of thing. Uh, and it was impossible for the government to... to, uh, to Maybe that's, that's a factor that was like manipulated things to go in, in this direction, I think. Uh, he, you see, what happened is that uh, uh, complacency. David Cameron and Osborne and many other people, we, because I was dealing, you know, because I was campaigning in Cardiff, uh, in, in Wales, because I became also the, the chair of the New Europeans uh, the, in, uh, in, 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 in Wales, uh, or before that um, in the, the Young European Movement. When I was dealing with people from the campaign, they were getting the word from London, I oh, don't worry, we will win. We will win London, we will win Scotland. And I was saying- Overconfident. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, they were extremely complacent. And we couldn't, and we felt on the pavement, on the streets of Cardiff, when we were verbally abused from various people, I cannot say now what they were saying, but okay, uh, that somehow we will lose. We, we, we sensed a few weeks down the line. But the people, uh, because the campaign was run only from London, they were focusing in London, they didn't bother. Whereas the Leave campaign, because it was not, that's why I was saying it was a unified campaign with not all with one center. So they were focused in one thing. And some of these people were, were, uh, uh, were very focused on this for decades. And they were saying, we want independence. Anyway, so go, go, please go to the second yeah. question. The second question is, like, uh, in your personal opinion, mm -hmm. Why do you think the Remain campaign did not take it much seriously as the other campaign? Well, in essence, anyway, I think I, 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 I was answering that throughout the lecture. I think it is not one thing. I think it's a catalog of blunders. It's, it's a list of things. I, I think, yeah, complacency, I think, was the, what's, the, what's the major thing. 
uh, when he called, uh, when David Cameron called the referendum for several weeks, uh, everyone believed that somehow by 60 to 40, definitely the Remain campaign will win. Then, uh, but this was a defining moment when uh, I, I was with other, I was with some uh, leading uh, politicians in Wales, and we were watching the news uh, when we were in the conference. And everyone, you know, I could see their faces becoming pale when they saw the announcement on the news that Boris Johnson had decided to join the Leave campaign. They knew that this ha this uh, would be extremely difficult to handle. He took most more than half of the Conservative Party with him, and because on the other hand. The, we had a, the, uh, someone like a, a, a Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party. He never managed to mobilize uh, his uh, followers and his com uh, and his uh, grassroots uh, campaigners. So when the because you would have expected, you know, when you see, I think the, um, the, the uh, pra practically when you see uh, here uh, the, the parties and. Um, uh, I will say, uh, you know, before that, what we're thinking was that uh, all of these parties will vote for Remain, like the Labour Party and um, uh, the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party and the SNP and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you would have expected the Conservative Party to be uh, uh, split in half. What we didn't expect was that the, the Labour Party. You see, you see, th this encapsulates his mood. He, ne he never really wanted. He never cared about it. He kept criticizing the EU even after the, 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 the loss. Uh, okay, so uh, I think it's uh, simple uh, like this. So you expected this one to be divided. You expect this one, this one, this one, this one to go for Remain. And you would expect Labour to be uh, to turn the tide and to be overwhelming re Remain. When you have a divided Labour, a divided Conservative Party, uh, it, it was enough uh, for this party to, to win. It's about lack of unity. Uh, I will have another question, but I will ask Aaron, Aaron, I'll ask you something because Aaron, have you considered why you know the leave is above the remain because you came up on this maybe because alphabetica, you know, like L and R and just make it. I'm not thinking. So I don't think that social media campaigns are purposefully kept it like that so that yeah. you don't know. Because by default, you're the first place. Yes. But that's why it's always yes and then no. And then leave them behind. And that's what I can see. Because the why should be after the no. Okay, because we know yes. But uh, I'm telling you this because I've heard that from some, back, some, some people from the Remain. They're saying, you know, why are you guys are complaining? I mean, the air comes before, you know, the R, the R, so that's why I have lived before. So there's always an argument. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, okay, I, I suppose that that might be one of the, um, of, the, of, the uh, of the answers. But I mean, it was never really properly explained. There's something else, you know. And, and sorry, sorry, just to, just to finish the point. And again, that is the thing. Everyone uh, felt that the Prime Minister was giving everything in order to appease this sec part of his party. Because this was, again, uh, he was fighting his own people from his own party. So he was trying to, to say, okay, I've given you everything. I gave you a referendum, I've given you leave, you can do whatever you want. Now that uh, he was planning to win, and if you, uh, he would have uh, uh, prevailed, he would have said, okay, you can have nothing to complain about. He never imagined that he would lose. But Michael, what, why did they accept it? All these unfair advantages, for example, you know, the day. Hmm. The day that the students were not going to be here in London. Why they accepted, for example, uh, the Thursday, which is uh, uh, why they accepted the conditions that you mentioned. I mean, if I was, let's say, you know, from the Remain, I would have said, no, these are unfair. I mean, these are, you know, against us, we should find some type of compromise. You know, they kind of accepted everything that kind of led them to the loss. But, but that is the thing. It wasn't exactly that they accepted it. It was themselves that they designed the referendum. It was the, the government, who the government officially was in favor of Remain, decided for the date, decided for the ballot papers, decided for everything. So, okay, so the suicide. So, yeah. I mean, they, they, yeah. they, they, they did everything. You know, that's that what I'm saying. It's, it's a massive, massive blunder. But how can you believe that you know, accounting, you know, this magnitude, you know, leaders of this, I mean, highly educated, I mean, they are on power, to make sort of tragic mistakes. What the right um, you know, to, to, to kind of, you know, accept things that, as later on you say, you do the analysis and say that all these things, you know, because bit by bit, right? I mean, the difference is only 2%. So if yeah, some of these things uh, would have been different, they would have a different outcome. Almost any one of these played the key factor. I think that for, for, uh, 
Okay, obviously, again, the, the, there is a problem because David Cameron never really replied. He disappeared out of the public and he never really explained his actions. Yes. But uh, for me, I think, that's my own contention, of course, that yeah, I'm not in his mind. I believe that because he had already won two successful referendums, and bear in mind that in the UK, technically, you, know, you don't have referendums, because there was the one in the, for voting reform in 2011 that he won, and again, the Scottish referendum, he might have felt but somehow he will be able to win a third kind one of an one. ego, like an ego type that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a double winner, so probably I will win again, so it, that I never it, will it is, it, it is a theory, again, he never really replied. Obviously, okay, yes, legally he had to do it at some point, but again, it was, it was a struggle who would prevail in, in the party, because he was fighting, uh, it was an inter, uh, internal conflict, a civil war, because he was, the same people who were complaining about him, there were some of his own ministers, so he was already a very weakened prime minister to, answer, uh, to, 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 to go back to the previous question, but somehow why he couldn't stay. Because he had lost from his own MPs and ministers, his position was untenable. And he had to manage a loss, you know, which is not good to manage a loss. He like staying and to manage a divorce. Uh, there is one question. I want to make another question because yes. I'm abusing my, my role and my power, yes. so the students should make questions. Oh. <laughs> okay, no more from me. Okay. No. Uh, Yes, yeah. um, so basically, from throughout this whole thing, are you saying the triggers are basically a divided country and parliament? Parliament right now, no. Uh, yeah. We've had a divided parliament, uh, especially because, okay, what happened is when Theresa May took over, okay, uh, she started the negotiations about the withdrawal agreement. But she was also not a favorite politician either. So she was what? She was yeah, not favorite. the most favorite. Um, yeah, everyone expected that Boris Johnson will succeed uh, David Cameron. Uh, again, because there was a political backstabbing, mm -hmm. uh, Boris Johnson... Uh, Boris Johnson, maybe he was smart. He let Theresa May to get burned, you mm -hmm. know, to take the hot potato, because that what just came out of the oven, mm -hmm. you know, see, you know, how she will handle it. He stepped back a little bit, and later on that he see that, you know, probably, you know, I mean, that's my, okay, probably humble mm -hmm. theory, that you know, you don't get the lead right after the fight. You just let someone you know, and then you know, you step back and say, "Okay, here we are to you know correct things." Uh, of course, these are just the, we, we don't we can we can only present presume. Yes, yes, but these are probably valid assumptions, right? Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Later on, we see that he came back as a savior. He said, "Okay." We let someone of, let's say, kind of common acceptance, because why? Because May was a Remainer in the past, mm -hmm. and that was a surprise. So she was someone of common acceptance, okay? She was, she took the lead to, you know, she took the role to lead the country out of the European Union, but she was not a hardcore, you know, like Exeter, because she was, so, and, and later on, you know. And that was why yeah. she had a massive problem, because she was never really accepted from either side. She was never a proper remainer, she was never a liver, so nobody was particularly happy. And what she did, and again, again, obviously, if we were focusing on Theresa May, this would have been a slightly different lecture, because she did again a massive number of mistakes. So she took over in 2016, and uh, it was a divided country, and uh, she would have stayed prior as prime minister for four years. Okay, she didn't have to do anything, because when you, uh, the, the five, it's a five-year term, and they had one in May 2015, so in 2017, on the 29th of May, that's a historic moment, um, they, she initiated Article 50. That's the withdrawal mechanism in order to leave the European Union within two years. <laughs> Another blunder, because she did, there was no point for her to do so. And a few, two months after that, what she did, she called the general election. And a lot of people that they had voted for in Maine and they were not happy for, 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 uh, for Brexit, they went to vote Labour Party, although perhaps some of them didn't like Jeremy Corbyn, and we ended up with another very extremely divided and complicated polit political landscape um, that uh, lasted until the, the election that uh, Boris Johnson called in December 2019, when he won an overall majority of, ever, of, of over 80 MPs. So to answer to your question, yes, it was a divided country, but because of Theresa May's actions as well, it was a divided parliament. Because I, I, she could have stayed without doing anything, she didn't even have to call this. Because the only way to, because some people, you know, they made the confusion. They they think of as Brexit the day of the referendum. The referendum, as we said, okay, it was an advisory referendum. Legally, didn't mean anything. 
politically it meant a lot. The, the legal way for the country to leave the European Union was this one, which would have meant that the country would have left the European Union uh, two years after that, so at the end of May 2019. And in fact, technically she did that, but because an agreement hadn't been uh, reached uh, by that time again with the EU, another massive embarrassment for Theresa May, she was going all the way to Brussels and she was asking for an extension from the EU. And of course, the, 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 the Brexit party grew as well, uh, with Nigel Farage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that's why when uh, in the last, in the historically last uh, European elections that they were held in the UK in 2019, the Brexit party did immensely well and won in the more, uh, it was a massive disaster for the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, so all the traditional parties uh, were destroyed on that day, yeah. and the Brexit Party won the more MEPs. Yeah. So politically, again, her position was untenable, she was, and she had to go. And the only person that could have united the party and made sure that they, as a Conservative Party as well, they will survive from the pressure of, of the Brexit Party was to have the, 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 the person who led the Brexit campaign, Boris Johnson. So his position then, uh, he, that's why he was extremely uh, a, a unifying figure, even for the Remainers. Because at the end of the day, they want to save their own uh, uh, party. Yeah. Okay, so I have to say, you know, let's keep the answers shorter, because I know your passion. We're going to have more questions, okay? Because if, okay. You, if you give an explanation, it's not that long. Do you have the answer? Right, right, there, will, right. there, there will be no lecture. So, there were more questions. Uh, there is one from, from this side, yes? Okay, we'll take two questions from here. So, uh, what, what my understanding says that it probably would have taken so long because the referendum in itself is, is so big, right? It has got a four section. It wasn't easy to define because it has got all the trade policies, right? Uh, immigration has been given there, right? Could be yeah. done overnight, right? So probably would have taken. You said that it has started long back, but yeah, would have taken so a long period of time just to decide upon this. It is in there in deep history. If you would have tried to explain me the referendum, it would probably take ages, right, for us to understand because it has got so many policies associated. So that's an interesting question. Uh, in fact, this was the biggest problem for the Remain campaign because what does leave means? For years in the country, nobody defined what leave would mean. So we, we knew what remain would mean, nothing would change, okay? But leave was open to interpretation. So that is why, after the resort, for years, they had to negotiate to reach an agreement with, with Europe. But the, the way to do it was to, uh, to invoke this article. If she had she technically made, you know, uh, she could have waited even more before an agreement with the EU would have been reached. So you mean she could have you know, say, I'm not triggering that. I'm not triggering it. No, she didn't have to do it. The only reason she did it was because politically she felt that uh, she, she had to do it and then have a general election because she wanted to win an election where she would be winning an election herself against Jeremy Corbyn without her own majority. What she didn't expect was that in effect, although technically she won, the Conservative Party won the election, she didn't have a majority. So suddenly we were in a stand made for years. So it's a very complicated um, uh, decision. So is it isn't uh, the change of policies are required? The one which was existing. So what do you mean? Uh, what, I, what I mean to say, what, what existing trade policies were there? They they don't need not any revision in that policy. Do we need to stick to the same? The, the trade policy you mean with the other EU member states? Uh, I mean yes. I mean probably because they have withdrawn. There must be some reason, right? Ideology behind it, which has to be explained. I mean, if they stayed with them, right? There must be some reason. Uh, and, and even though if it would have been followed since then, right, there should be some reason. I mean, I, if I would have written something, it has to be revised after a certain period of time, looking into a lot of things, right? It's, it's uh, a good trade policy. In terms of trade, obviously, the UK, as a member state of the European Union, it was following the rules and regulations of the EU, so it was a collective decision. And this is something that the Leave campaign was saying. But now let's be on ourselves, let's be on our own in order to make our own decisions and our own agreements, if that's what you mean. So when they left, uh, when they were about to leave, uh, there was a discussion about how they were going to leave. And for years we didn't know. We didn't know if there would be an agreement, if there would be. For years there was a discussion about leaving without the deal. Yes. So reverting back to the World Trade Organization rules. 
So it was a nightmare, and, and that's why many companies, you can see, I have some articles in, by 2019, so before the end of this period, because they were afraid of what would happen, they left the country, and they, they set up their headquarters in Frankfurt or in Amsterdam or in Brussels, because they were afraid of this catastrophe. This catastrophe didn't happen because an agreement was reached in the end, but nevertheless, nobody knew in what kind of way the trade would continue. And this was another problem because the people didn't really know what they were voting because nobody told them how we will end up, uh, in what situation we will end up with. <coughs> Two questions. One. I'm not sure if I explained that. I mean, I mean, that was good, but yeah, still, I mean, because see, the line has to be drawn in many ways, right? I mean, before you can come down to early season, I can't, I mean, one day just sort of and say, okay, fine, we will draw, right? Because this is what happened, though. They, they, they said, let's leave, but before saying what will happen on the day after, because they were saying we will negotiate afterwards how we will leave. So you have this divorce, but without saying, let's say, what will, uh, usually before you have this divorce, you say what will happen with the house, the car, the money, the children. They said we will do this, all of them afterwards. And this is why we, have, we ended up for chaos for years. Okay. My question is entirely different now. My question is for any such major event, the basis or the most important factor is the economic factor that people consider. If you remain, what are the positives that you have? If you leave, what are the positives that you have? Now, what I understood from your history, because I haven't uh, gone in depth into this, is just a play of power, that's it. And they purposefully downplayed the economic factor, because that is going to be the deciding factor in the future. This is what is the uncertainty, the economic uncertainty yeah. factor. Yeah, exactly. This is what the remaining campaign was focused on. The remaining campaign focused on somehow stronger in the economy, the economy will be stronger. The, uh, the Brexit campaign, because again it was uncertainty, because they didn't promise, because they couldn't say what will happen afterwards. No, 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 I'm talking about Brexit, the leave campaign. Yeah. Because even when you're leaving, I'm sure you must have calculated all the numbers. They didn't that, specify. But was it considered at least, or not at all? I mean, that would be a blind thing. Uh, uh, Exactly. This is, this is what they were doing. But, but they were saying, you know, they, they were they saying. Didn't specify because, because I'm sure, yeah. Professor, that would be the driving factor. Maybe yeah. that was not confused. The, the driving factor in 2016 for the referendum was mainly immigration. The, 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 number, the number one thing that people, because, okay, some people obviously, when they, they are being asked, they are afraid to reply properly, so they are saying other things. But I mean, the vast majority of people, when they were freely replying, they were saying that somehow they were afraid of uh, immigration. And the thing is that the, the Brexit campaign, uh, that they played on that. And that's why you see this slogan and this thing. Ironically, this didn't have to do anything with the EU. For example, you have seen now in the news what is happening with France and the, uh, poor people crying, you know, they're trying, they're dying while they're crossing. And this thing happens after Brexit. It didn't happen when the UK was in the EU. Because it wouldn't happen, because France would have stopped it. So it was the same people that they were voting for Brexit, for, for immigration purposes, they were actually, actually were even more angry now because they felt that they were voting for something totally different in their mind. Uh, but I will come back to your this because it's not that they had a specific plan, but it played the part of the global leader since then. So they said that if we exit, we will have our, our um, um, operating independence. So that, so it's not broken down to, numer to numbers, but that means that you know, if you go towards what is called like global Britain, it means you know, reuniting with the Commonwealth and reuniting with, you know, with our cousin, you know, like America or, or Australia. So the, the, the people did not have a clear picture of, of numbers, but they had an idea that if we team up with America, you know, we're not going to lose much, you know, we'll have a stronger life. So, that, that was probably something that, that they did not specify, but they left that to be, you know, in the back of your mind that, you know, yeah. we, don't worry, we have less. There's a question here, Michael, here. Yeah. I was just going to say, just to bring it back to leadership, um, what type of differences did you see in the picture, like the four main characters, like the four main the characters? Four main characters. What was the differences? Leadership, I mean, who had like strong leadership, who had like the leadership traits, and who was, you know, de definitely, the winner, uh, definitely Boris Johnson, uh, because he made a, he made a very clear, uh, clear, uh, but very strategic decision on the day that he joined the other group, mm -hmm. and we knew that he will emerge as a national leader. If he had if he had followed Cameron, 
Cameron would have stayed as prime minister for many years. And the number and the person that would have expected for years to succeed Cameron was the finance minister, George Wordsworth. So, uh, and never Boris Johnson. But uh, people liked him, yes, okay, that's fine, but he became the mayor, but he, they wouldn't have allowed him to progress. And by doing that, uh, he, he, uh, perhaps you might say that, yes, okay, he said some things that went against his own beliefs, the things that he was saying and writing and saying for years. So, uh, actually, there, if, you, if you Google or if you go and you will search, you will see that he had documentaries himself saying how much he loved Turkey and he needed to go to Turkey because his ancestors came from Turkey. Uh, so you, and then he, they were using this slogan that somehow Turkey will join the EU. And in fact, the government didn't join. David Cameron never said that, and they wanted, that the UK government wanted Turkey to join. And in fact, Turkey has been discussing about joining for the last 16 years. And even the Turkish government doesn't really want to join because they don't want to, to have the, the EU rules and regulations for other purposes. And so and so, so they, were, they, they specifically said things that didn't make any kind of sense. Uh, no, it, because he had a target. The person who failed miserably, of course, is David Cameron, who, as the, the Prime Minister, he had also, uh, not only he failed himself, his party, his supporters, he failed the country. When you are the leader of the country, first and foremost, you have to think about the country. And in effect, by resigning, he did the right thing for the country. Because he had to, he was toxic after all. I don't know if I would have resigned. A leader never resigns. I would have given a fight, you know, to, to, to probably, you know why? Because if he was staying, probably he would have not written that article. Exactly. You know? Yes. So why, why? Why? Politically, it was impossible. He was, he, politically, he could have delayed it, you know, keep on delaying it. Because, you know, something, when we had more delays, people that they were, you know, realizing in this big change, they would say, maybe, maybe we did a mistake. So, I mean, I would have stayed and played to the death, you know, like this delay, uh, and say, you know, okay, I lost, but I, I just, you know, I try to. Hey, you know, Obviously, now it's just about it and the placebo effect will wear off. Sorry, what? If, if, if he delayed, yeah. if, if people would give it more time to think about it, and yeah, if, if any other like party started the campaign to influence the perception of people, mm. after a certain time, that influence fades away if you don't keep on investing into it, and how long can they keep on investing into it as, as much as I can keep on delaying on it? And then that would give him a push, uh, at least for, for a certain time, and then a, a next move, and a next move. He can still have stayed in the game. I don't think that uh, he would have been able to do so for another reason. Uh, the Conservative Party is a very, as they say, them, some people call them the nasty party or the cruel party. They have a legacy of toppling their own leaders. So, for example, Theresa May didn't exactly go. She was ousted because she was voted out, in effect, from the members of, of the MEPs of her party. But she reached an agreement, okay, instead of uh, her being thrown out completely, she, she said, okay, I'm, I'm resigning and that's it. So he would have uh, been dealt uh, such a blow himself, which would have been extremely embarrassing for himself and the party and, and his legacy. So I think by doing that, he did, he felt that maybe he had to, to step down in order to, to, to make sure that as well, the party will not suffer as well. Politically, would it be more detrimental to him if he kept delaying it, right? Yes, he, he, he wouldn't have been allowed to do that from his own party, though. Yeah. Because, you see, from the very first day, even the people who used to support Remain, even Theresa May, she was a Remainer, technically. She said, okay, yes, the people have spoken, we have to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and the Labour Party said the same. And even the Liberal Democrats, after a while, that they were the more hardcore European But Democrats. there were voices for a second referendum. So, if I was Cameron, which, you know, I am not, you know, I would have stayed and given the fight, you know, for a second referendum. Because there were, remember, there were voices of, you know, think again, maybe we should have a second referendum, but when you step out, you know, you don't have this. Uh, but know, who would have led this from the, from the government? He couldn't lead himself a second referendum because the people would have said, because during the campaign, you have to, to, to lead it. You know, he will delegate someone else, he said, because I lost my yeah, political. I'm, I'm buying you the power for you to lead it. So I'm giving, you know, I said, I take, you know, for uh, uh, I can, Actually, I can tell you something. For several months after the result, the, the, the pro European movement, the, 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 the remain. They were such in disarray and in disillusionment after that yeah. defeat yeah. Uh, that uh, uh, everything was bleak. But it, t it took a few years, and, and, and the fact that 
there was a resurgence of the movement after, again, from another, uh, due to a, a very poor leadership decision from Theresa May, when she called, with, again, without the proper reason, an election um, in, a, it was in a, a June 2017, or May 2017, uh, and she led, and, and there was a divided uh, country again. Then there was a resurgence of what you're saying now, but it had already, like, over a year had already passed. So some people were uh, uh, more ready to campaign again. And the, uh, and the and, and I was involved in, again in this campaign, but, and there were demonstrations in London for with around a million people saying we want uh, second not exactly a second, second referendum second. per se, but a so-called people's vote, as it was called, which because, and, and there is a, there's a distinction, a second referendum would have meant, yes, that somehow we don't like this, and every time we don't like a pe the vote, we'll somehow we will ignore it. Yeah. The people's vote was about the definition, because before that, nobody, even the government, very poorly, uh, the, the, of David Cameron, they never defined what live would mean. So everyone in their own mind, you know, they had what live would mean, and they were voting for whatever they felt was the right thing. So the people's vote was a campaign that lasted up until 2019, and again, after, after the defeat from uh, um, when, the, when Boris Johnson won an outright majority, everything stopped and everything finished. It was at the, the end of the movement. Uh, they, were, they were asking for a, like a vote where the people somehow would be able to say, yes, we are happy with this result, or we can, uh, uh, we, we can have an opportunity to go back to things where prior to 2016. Mm -hmm. This was never materialized, and uh, we are where we are now. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, even if they are, let's say no, because we have, we have to put a name to this. But maybe you, you should come. Uh, cool. It's a really short one. Yeah. No, of course you can come on, because I'm just saying. So, you have um, <laughs> was there anything at all that the Brevain campaign did right? Let's, because everything this analysis is uh, being done I mean, retro I mean. retrospectively. So let's say if they had won, um, what would be your analysis? Like, just they have a lot of resources, or? All the main parties they supported remain. Uh, if they had won, it would have been. Uh, uh, I, again, I don't think that anyone would have applauded them because by winning, um, in effect, it would have been like the, the automatic thing to do, the natural thing to do. Very, bearing in mind that all the political parties supported this, so it's like um, uh, this is this is something that you, you cannot really congratulate someone. Let's say for doing their job properly or do it simply by turning up to work. But when they're not turning back, they're not turning uh, up to work, you say that uh, something is wrong here. So I don't think that would have been a very uh, great success. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, one of the reasons why perhaps the people and the campaigners, this is where you see uh, the difference here. It was extremely difficult, let's say, for, for Cardi, for, for Wales, for us, to find a few people simply to go and give a few leaflets. The people were very complacent or they simply didn't bother because they didn't want to cooperate with people from other parties even for this very important issue. They only realized the disaster after the end of the, of the, of the campaign. So I'm, I hope that... Um, yeah. Well, uh, we will have to put an end to this. I mean, now... <laughs> but the second lecture, you know, Tim, Timmy? <laughs> I will cover it briefly. So, Mr. Arabis, thank you very much. You know, thank you once again. You know, thank you very much. Uh, I believe I have your email. Uh, yes, your email. The email is on the uh, on your CV. So, if any of you guys, students, you know, who would like to write to Mr. Arabis about the question, I believe that Mr. Arabis would find mm -hmm. the reply. Or you can use this one in the first slide. It's like the from the New Europeans, the organization where I'm the uh, yes. treasurer and one of the trustees. Um, yeah, we had a, like a more different one. Uh, yes, uh, the one was your personal one. Yeah, this, 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 this one is best for this occasion. Uh, and obviously, you will have all the all, all the, the already sent you the yes. slides. So uh, you will have the opportunity if you want to, to read uh, some things. Uh, and obviously, I guess I, I know it were quite a lot, but <coughs> believe me, I tried to make it to make it quite compact. I tried. It. It's a massive subject, but you understand. Yes, it's a good thing that you know, we're having the first hour because we would have not been able to do that in a seminar hour. Yes, the slides will be on my... Um